welcome Dr. Charlie Dates, the one and only, to be able to bless and encourage our church family. We are excited. We can't wait to hear what God's going to say through him today. Happy 50th birthday to my big brother, uh, the leader among leaders, the preacher of preachers. It's an honor to be here. Glad to be in Dallas with our Concord family. Beginning at verse 18, the Bible says, while he was still speaking, Another also came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind from across the wilderness came and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshiped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. This morning, I flew all the way from Chicago here to say one thing to somebody. You got to praise your way through. That's what I want to talk about this morning. Will you turn to your neighbor as you take your seat? Tell them, neighbor, neighbor. Praise, your praise your way through. Amen. You may be seated. God, give me Gracious God, our Father, we do thank and praise you for Jesus Christ, our Savior, for the help and the hope that is ours in his name. I beg of you now for clarity of mind, concision of speech, and conviction of heart, that I may tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Help me not to be afraid of the faces that I'm looking at, but give me the grace to preach your word in the way where we will leave here transformed and inspired. I know that you can. Now I ask that you will. And if I've asked you for too little, I pray you do something even bigger than what I just asked you for. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You ever run into something that seemed to be out of place? Like it just didn't seem like it belonged there? Like raisins and potato salad? You know... Raisins go a lot of places, and they are good for you. They just don't belong in a potato salad. That, that, that's a more humorous out-of-place sighting. But what about a more serious out-of-place sighting? Like a certain felon on the presidential ballot. Just, just seems out of place. I'm not here to make a political statement. All I'm saying is I, I know people, I grew up with people who are considered felons and they don't even have the right to vote right now, let alone run for the highest office in the land. It's just, it's out of place. One is humorous, one is serious, maybe one that is sacred. You've probably walked by it many times like I have and didn't even pay attention to the fact that it was there. It's in Times Square. His brother, David Wilkerson, and he decided in 1987 that they would create an oasis of God's great power amid the prostitution, the drug addiction, and the shows that happened in Times Square. And so they started a church. The church is doing so well now, actually. It's one of the fastest growing churches in America, one of the most effective churches in a bustling city center in a place where a lot of people say churches cannot grow. But when next time you're in Times Square, when you walk by, just look for it. It's right there. It says the church at Times Square. Thousands of people file in there every weekend to hear the gospel in what used to be a den of prostitution and drug addiction because David Wilkerson and his brothers saw potential to create an outpost of heaven. It caught my attention maybe because... Sometimes we do not recognize the strength of something until it seems out of place. It's, it's when it's not located in its normal genre or category that it raises our attention. 
I must confess that that's how I feel every time I come to the first chapter of Job. This is a praise that seems out of place. You, you know, generally we praise God when the weight is lost, when the mortgage gets burned, uh, when the disease is healed, uh, when our enemies have been silenced. But, but here Job raises an altar of praise at the ash heap of his misery as if to say to us that there is a way to handle the trauma and tragedies of life. That when you're in the middle of what you're going through, that when it feels uncertain about how it will turn out, that when you are drenching your pillow with tears at night and your heart is filled with anxiety based upon an uncertain future, that's the time to praise the Lord. That's the time to be defiant about your worship. That's the time to pull up to church on Sunday morning. And before they could even invite you in to say hallelujah, your hands automatically go up in the air and your mouth fills itself with praise. Because when you praise God in the middle of your circumstance, you send a confusing signal of defeat to your enemy. I know I'm right about it. Now, I know I'm on good exegetical grounds because that's the way the book of Job opens. The Bible introduces us to a man named Job. It calls a perfect and upright man. He literally gets the highest commendation of a human being next to Jesus Christ in the scriptures. This is strange and weird. We, we don't have a lot of Job's in the world. We got a lot of cussing Peters. We got a number of doubting Thomases. We, we have a few of uh, Rahab's, but not a lot of Job's. Job was an upright man, the Bible says. Old King James says he eschewed evil. He turned his way. He covenanted with his eyes that he would not look upon evil. And one day when the sons of God were coming to present themselves before the Lord, the enemy of our souls showed up. and God said to him, have you considered my servant Job? Oh, that's a recommendation you don't want to get. But the enemy says to him, oh, you know, can't nobody mess with Job because you got a hedge of protection around Job and Job's stuff. But I tell you, if you remove that hedge and let me tap Job's stuff, Job will curse you like everybody else because the only reason Job worships you is because of the stuff you gave him. Oh, friends, I wish I could tell you that that was a total lie about some of us. But the truth is, a lot of people in church are more in love with God's hands than we are God's face. We like to receive stuff from God, and we miss the actual beauty of God. So God says to the enemy, I tell you what, you can go ahead and take Job's stuff. The only thing that I'm going to say to you is don't touch Job's life. Don't touch his soul. And there, there in that fateful moment, the enemy comes and snatches all of Job's cattle. In one day, all of his property is gone. His servants kill in one day. To make matters worse, his children are all dining, seven sons and three daughters at one of the sons' house, as was their normal rhythm in life. And a hurricane comes, and the Bible says strikes the four corners of the house, lifts the roof up off of the house, kills all of the children in one moment, in rapid succession. Job has lost his money, his property, his cattle, and now his children. And the servant comes to him and says, I'm the only one who escaped. Who made it to tell you about this? What does Job do when the bottom falls out? What does Job do when the blow strikes, when the knife cuts? It's one of the strangest things you'll ever read in the word ever. Job rends his clothes as an ancient Near Eastern sign of grief. He falls to his face and he begins to worship God. Job teaches us that you can be grieving and worshiping at the same time. 
that when you come to church, you don't have to pretend like everything is the way you want it to be. Sometimes we sing aspirationally in church. We sing until it becomes so what is not so yet. Job tears his clothes, falls to the ground, here it is, and worships God. Friends, I don't know how that strikes you, but when life falls apart in a lot of people's existence, they want to recoil, fold up, and die. But Job teaches us that you don't have to take what the enemy levels against you fall apart and die. No, you got a choice, child of God. Rather than laying in bed all morning and pulling the covers over your head, rather than being sad, rather than being mad at the world and cussing everybody else out, you got a choice. You can stand back up, square your shoulders, fix your gaze, lift your voice to the Lord and say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I wish I had somebody who heard me in here. I said, I wish I had somebody who heard me in here. Job is saying, everything I got has come from the Lord. And since it has come from the Lord, I'm going to give God praise. I'm not going to let my circumstance rob me of the joy that God has given me. If God has blessed me in this way, he deserves my highest praise. Now, I know why some of us can't relate to that because we like to simply praise God for the stuff he's given us rather than worshiping God for the great God that he is. Did y'all hear me in here? I said, did you hear me in here? He is splendid in majesty. He is the unique face of his human salvation. He is radiant and exclusive in salvation history. He is superlative in magisterial authority. He is radiant in splendor. He's the God of gods. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. My mama used to say, he's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He is alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, the faithful and true witness. He is Abel's vindicator, Abraham's sacrifice, Gideon's fleets, Samson's strength, David's song, Solomon's wisdom, Rahab's red hope. And when you flip to the New Testament, he's Matthew's royal king. He's Mark's suffering servant. He's Luke's great physician. He's John's word made flesh. He's Acts the coming of the Holy Ghost. If he don't do nothing else, he's greater than anybody you have ever met. He is worthy of our highest praise. And I wonder as I come in here today, is there anybody who can praise God just because of who he is and not all the stuff that he's giving you? I said, is there anybody who can worship his name today just because he's God and he's God all by himself? Oh, but it gets better, Pastor Carter, because we don't just have to praise and worship God for who he is. We also can thank him for what he's done. I said, everything that's great about him is so high, but he's come so low. We had a man at our church in Salem who used to shout every Sunday. Y'all ain't in here with me. I said he used to shout every Sunday. Pastor loved him because if didn't nobody else shout, he knew that guy was going to shout. Well, it was cool at first, and then it started to get on people's nerves. They were annoyed. Here we go again. True story, shouting again and again. Even the praise and worship leaders, we were like, now come on now. We just started singing. You ain't got to be shouting like that. Every Sunday, my man shouted again and again. So we're at the church retreat one year. We're doing testimonies. It's a dangerous exercise, but let people come to the microphone and to tell their story. And you know who came to grab the mic to tell a story? Everybody's, oh, God, here we go again. He grabbed the mic. He said, hey, listen, I know, I know y'all see me shouting every week. You wondering what's going on with me. He said, I, I don't mean to bother y'all. He, he said, but I'm a pharmacist. He said, and uh, one day, two thieves broke into the pharmacy. And they stole a lot of what we had. But to keep my mouth closed, they taped my mouth and my hands and threw me in the trunk of a car. 
They drove me off, true story, to the side of a road, and they started throwing gasoline on the car. He said, I could smell it, and I could hear it dripping in the car. Then they torched the car. They threw fire at it, and the car started to burn. He said, and in that moment, I just called on the only name that I know. And I told God, God, if you get me out of this, you'll never have to worry about me praising your name. He stood up in front of our church and said, I know y'all won't believe this, but when the fire department showed up to put the fire out, the whole car had burned except the trunk. He said it was like a wall went around the trunk. So excuse me if every Sunday I come in here and I got a shout on my lips, but you ain't been through what I've been through, so you ought to let me praise my there was somebody in here today who knows that you've been so close to hell you still smell like smoke you just don't know how much God has delivered you from but maybe there are a thousand or two thousand of y'all in here this morning that know that God has seen you through I said God has seen you through danger seen and unseen we ought to pause for station identification real quick this worship service is telling you now you can praise and worship God because of who he is and what he's done but watch this now when you do so you prove that your enemy is a liar you defeat him because the enemy said Job is only praising you based upon the stuff you gave him and when you take that away I promise you he's not going to worship you and that's the same bet that the enemy is hedging against some of you. The only reason they're in church is because of the stuff that you gave them. Oh, but here it is, Job. Job, the Bible says, falls to the ground. He went to the bottom, the rock bottom. And when he got to the bottom, he found out there's a rock at the bottom. And the enemy is looking at Job saying, now, I didn't pull my best shot. I didn't took everything he had. Trauma's real, y'all. I, I have hurt his heart. I have pressed him to the point where he should not be believing. But what is he doing? See, friends, when you praise God in the middle of your trauma, you force your enemy to back up off of you. You create a safe zone because the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And when you confuse the enemy, the enemy has to take his hands off of you. Can I give you a remedy for some of the trouble you're facing? Praise God. When you lift him in worship, you confuse what he's planning to do. I read, I read that after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, September of 2006, that the Superdome had been put back together basically in a year. New Orleans was reeling and rocking and difficult feeling, pain and frustration. That night, though, on Monday Night Football, the Atlanta Falcons had come in to play the Saints. And the energy in the stadium was so wild that it literally confused the signals of the Falcons. The Falcons went to hike the ball for a punt, but because the noise was so intense, they missed the signal, and Gleason grabbed it and scored a touchdown. Tony Kornheiser, who's the NFL commentator, says, I'll never forget it again in my life. I have never felt noise like that in a building before, and I will never feel it since. He said that their cheering made so much noise that it confused their opponent and they won the game. I got to thinking about that. You had fans cheering 
like y'all do for your cowboys. I know, I know, say with me though, keep going. <laughs> Buying tickets to a game, standing up making noise for people who ain't never paid their bills, ain't never put food on their table, wearing jerseys with folks' names they will never meet, cheering loudly for somebody who ain't never paid tuition, ain't never watched over them all night long, have never provided anything, but we come to church and we stand before the God of God and the kings of kings who has done all of this. And what we learn is that when the saints go up in praise, that's when deliverance starts to take place. If the fans of the saints can make noise in New Orleans and confuse their enemy, the saints at Concord can make noise and make the enemy back up off of you in this church today. Come on in here. Let's raise our praise to the Lord. I double dare you. Whatever you're facing, throw your hands up and say, God, I still trust you. I still believe you. I still know Now, 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 what does Job say? Job falls to the ground. He defeats the enemy. But then he turns around and he exalts God because that's the way praise works. He defeats the enemy and he turns around and lifts the name of the Lord. When you praise God, you are not denying reality. You are acknowledging God's goodness in the middle of your reality. Uh, I'm here today to tell you that when you praise God, you recognize that the bad things God permitted to happen in your life cannot derail the good things that God has purposed to be in your life. If God let that thing go, it must mean he got something better coming for me right up the road. If God let the enemy take that, he must be making room for something bigger than what he took. I'm here today to tell you that when you praise God, you defeat your enemy, but then you turn around and you exalt your Savior. Oh, and that's what we need. We need more worship that's about God. Not just about us. To, to see God as bigger than the election in a few weeks. To see God as greater than the trouble of the school district. To see God as mighty and powerful in spite of what has happened or has not happened. Job says, here it is, blessed be the name of the Lord. This word blessed in the Hebrew Masoretic text is the word from which we get our word Barak. It, it means full of strength. It, it means unlimited capacity. It, it means power beyond measure. Listen to what Job is declaring. Job is saying that in spite of what I've lost, my God still has enormous power. I got to accept what happened. And I'll tell you why I got to accept it. Because I came here with nothing. And I'm going to leave with nothing. Which means everything that I have has come from the hand of God. Naked I came. Naked will I go back. But blessed be the name of the Lord. That's good. That's an amazing way to praise God. I know we encourage y'all to say a lot of stuff, but that's, that's a praise you ought to put in your own pocket. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There's a lot to a name, y'all. There are many names for God in the scriptures. But Job says, full of strength and power is his name that I came here with nothing and I'm going to leave with nothing. But what I still have is a God who's full of power. You may have lost a lot, 
or seemingly everything, but you ain't by yourself, child of God. This morning, I'm preaching to you today because God is saying to you, I'm still with you. I have not left you. I have not forsaken you. And if you hold on to me through this, you're going to make it to the other side. Did y'all hear me in here? I said he's, he's telling you that if you stick with him through what you're going, you will make it to the other side. And there is a blessing on the other side of your trauma. I've come to see that way too many of us give up before God gets to show us the amazing blessing that he has on the other side of going through. My college pastor used to say to us, and it came to pass. It didn't come to stay. That, that's old King James language. It's only going to help a few people. He used to say, whatever you're going through, hold on because it comes to pass. That heartache you're going through, it comes to pass. That divorce you're reeling from, it'll come to pass. That disease you're recovering from, it'll come to pass. The pain of the loss, it will come to pass. And what you got to trust God for is that God has a blessing on the other side of through. That if you determine to stick with him, he's going to blow your mind with what he's got on the other side. I'm in my seat. May the Lord God bless y'all real good. But I'm glad I brought my own testimony as I prepare to take my seat. My pastor was helping teaching, rather, his daughter how to drive. They got on the expressway for the first time. When they got on the expressway, he said in a few moments, just a couple exits down, a major storm came. Rain just came out of nowhere. He said it was literally flooding rain all over, and he saw his baby tense up and grab the steering wheel. She got nervous, and other cars were starting to pull over, trying to get close to a viaduct, and he could tell she was looking over. And he said, baby, don't pull over, don't pull over. As long as you can see the lights on the back of that truck, keep on driving. He, he, she said, but daddy, everybody's pulling over. They, they know this is bad. He said, don't do it. Don't do it. Keep driving behind the lights on the back of that truck. He said, literally, as quick as the storm came, it left. He said, three exits down, they were out of the storm. And he asked her, hey, baby, where are all the people who pulled over? She looked in the rearview mirror and she saw that they were still in the storm. She said, Daddy, they still in the storm. He said, that's why I told you to keep on driving because if you just keep on going, there's a blessing on the other side of the storm. Did y'all hear me in here? I, I said, there's a blessing on the other side of the storm. Keep on praising God today. Keep on shouting hallelujah. Keep on raising your voice because there's a blessing on the other side of your trouble. Some of y'all are asking, well, how did that work out for old man Job? Well, I'm glad you asked. Old man Job lost everything he had. The flesh fell from his bones. His friends came and accused him of malfeasance. His wife said, you ought to curse God and die. But Job said, Job said, Job said, I'm going to wait till my change comes. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that I shall see him in the last days. And when you get to the end, Job, the Bible says that God blessed Job with new property, new kids, and a new spouse. He got more than he lost. God gave him double for his trouble because that's how good God is. Did y'all hear me in here? I said that's how good God is. He'll give you double. Keep on praising. Keep 
us the Christ. Maybe Job didn't grab you, but Jesus will. One Friday evening, they put nails in his hands and a spear in his side and a crown of thorns on his head. And he laid down dead in a borrowed tomb. But that's not 